be devastating, knowing that once again their rights and culture have been violated, disregarded, and disrespected will affect the mental health of the population. It is no secret that anxiety, depression, and suicide are much higher among First Nations people, and it's also no secret why. We have identified our treatment and history with First Nations in trying to strip them of their culture as a major factor in their poorer health outcomes and issues with mental health. Yet we feel compelled to let history repeat itself by stripping them of their rights once again, the right to make decisions in regards to the use of their own land. Secondly, let's think about the allowance of normal spillage from the tankers and pipeline and the potential cumulative water and air pollution from this. What effects will this have on the health of the coastal First Nations communities and the communities along the pipeline route? Who has researched this potential risk and who will track it? I will have a similar example that will stress my point. While working in an inland First Nations community a couple of years ago, the people there were concerned about the health effects that nearby mining operations were having. This was voiced to me as a practitioner on several occasions, and I saw firsthand the community's concerns while collaborating with a mining company that was hoping to start exploration in the area. The community members were noting increased occurrences of cancer and respiratory illnesses, which they felt were not present or as common prior to the establishment of the mines. With fragmented staff working at the health clinics, which is the case for most remote communities, and with no one investigating or tracking their health patterns over time, there is no way to validate or dispute their concerns. But let's look back to Sarnia, where we know that regular allowable amounts of chemicals have been leaked into the water and air for years. The air quality there is known to be the poorest in Canada, and only now are they admitting to having detrimental effects on the community's health. The companies responsible for the rare cancers are saying that they didn't know back then that this would happen, but we know now. Maybe it would be several decades before health before effects to health would be obvious, and we'll claim that we didn't know. But we also didn't bother to check. And I'm just talking about allowable pollution. I won't bother to expand upon a second example of similar occurrence, as I'm sure you are familiar with the community of Fort Chippewan and their health concerns in relation to the tar sands. There's been a recent movement in medicine in relation to mental health and a connection with nature. There are books written on the topic, and a conference was held here in Vancouver last year. Vancouver boasts, its, boasts itself on green space within the city, and the main component of this being a positive effect on human well-being. In coastal First Nations communities where a connection with wildlife is common, what effect would there be if the species that they see regularly were to suddenly disappear, simply related to the presence of tankers? In one community where I was stationed, I would frequently hear over the radio of the pods of whales near fishing boats and of expeditions into the forest to see spirit bears. This is part of their connection to nature, one that I believe strongly supports their mental health in a positive way, as well as the health of myself, tourists, and other British Columbians who travel in the outdoors and on the coast as a means of spiritual, physical, and mental support. Now let's move on to what will happen if there is a spill. What will the effects on health be then? For so many First Nations people, their sustenance comes directly from the land and sea. Unlike ourselves who drive to the grocery store and pick what we like with no idea where it is coming from. I had first-hand experience with this while working in Hartley Bay, where there is no grocery store, convenience store, restaurant, or any access to food other than what is caught in the area or flown or for ferried in from Prince Rupert. That is, if you are able to fly or ferry it in based on the weather, and if you are willing to pay a price. After a couple of weeks there, I wasn't so sure I'd brought in enough. Thank goodness that this community is very generous, and local food abounds, although not in a store. One of the men brought me either fresh crab or fresh halibut every few days. He told me stories of the huge halibut he had caught in the surrounding waters, up to 150 pounds. I remember he went out on a Saturday this particular stormy when he called to say fresh crab was ready for pickup. I was shocked that he had gone out. He told me, that, told me that he had to feed his family. He grew up on the sea and was not concerned with the storm. I'm sure the panel is aware of the geographical position of Hartley Bay in terms of tanker traffic. They will be passing right by this tiny community. I saw firsthand how much they truly rely on a healthy ocean, and I'm very concerned for them and what will happen there when a spill occurs. How will they feed themselves? One of the community members whom I worked with said to me that they better have a space ready for us in Ottawa because when there is a spill, we will have nowhere else to go. We were talking about the collapse of an entire community and way of life. I could have not imagine what the response would be and what my response would be if I were working in that community and responsible for their health at that time at the time of the spill. It's not like I don't have rightful means for concern here, being that a fairy, the Queen of the North, managed to crash into an island near this community not so long ago. The people remember this. 
Finally, let's touch upon the bigger picture here, the collective health of British Columbians and our entire human population. Recent studies in relation to climate change and health have been popping up. The Canadian Nurses Association has a special group devoted to environmental health, which specifically relates their concerns in relation to greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases, gases, climate change, and the effects on health. Our environment is one of the social determinants of health, and climate change is a social justice issue. We know that third world nations will take the brunt of this effect. This parallels the particular situation now in which coastal First Nations communities are at the front lines. Our government of Canada states that it cares about the health of Canadians. It claims equality and justice for all. Yet there is another picture that was just formed in which health, equality, and justice do not come first. Those here speaking at these hearings know what is driving this propo proposal, and the fact is that the government of Canada is willing to choose money above all else. Great, thanks a lot, Ms. Martin. Um, Mr. Restemeyer, am I close? <laughs> okay. okay, please uh, share your views on the project with us. Sure. Okay, thanks. So my name is Brett Restemeyer, and I am a resident of North Vancouver. I'm here today to voice my opposition for the proposed Enbridge Northern Gateway project and its subsequent super tankers. I moved to British Columbia four years ago from southwestern Ontario. This area of Ontario is home to sprawling urbanization, deforestation, smoggy, humid summers, polluted rivers, lakes, and streams, and one awful NHL hockey team. I have been intrigued about British Columbia since early high school due to its abundant mountains, its wildlife, glacier-fed waterways, outdoors activities, and its vast ocean ecosystem. I am still in awe of all these features of BC on a daily basis and continue to explore new areas, new people, and ways of life through my personal and work travels. I love this province. I will always call it home. I'm a registered nurse as well. I've been in this profession for five years. My training is in emergency nursing. I've had the privilege of working in numerous communities throughout coastal and northern BC, as well as northern Alberta. I've worked in First Nations communities, and in the coming years, we'll be working for six months of the year in different First Nations communities throughout northwestern BC. Clem 2, Hartley Bay, and Kakatla are three of them. I know the proposed pipeline and tanker route will negatively impact all of these communities and the communities that I've already worked in. I'm also aware that all these communities have and continue to express their staunch opposition to the proposed Northern Gateway project. And why shouldn't they? The project is in direct violation of the Coastal First Nations Declaration and Save the Fraser Declaration. These laws are set up to protect the coast and rivers from oil spills. And as Unbridge has said in the media, it cannot guarantee that there will not be an oil spill. The Northern Gateway project is in essence illegal. I've had the pleasure to see firsthand how First Nations communities truly live off their land through fishing, crabbing, hunting, and seaweed and invertebrate harvesting. I truly admire their emotional, spiritual, and physical connection to the earth, and I've tried to mimic this in my day-to-day -day life. I've had some wonderful nursing experiences in First Nations communities. However, some of my clinical experiences have set off major alarm bells in my head. In certain communities, I have noticed alarmingly high cancer rates, rare cancers, as well as large numbers of benign tumors and lumps which required surgical removal. In these communities, mining, mining for minerals and precious metals were rampant, with many new exploration projects being undertaken. Although there are no studies to confirm my findings, I believe there is a direct correlation between mining and its toxic chemical byproducts being released into the soil, air, and water, and the high proportion of cancer and benign tumor rates in these communities. I'm truly fearful for what will happen when an oil spill occurs from the Northern Gateway project, whether it is via their pipeline or super tankers. Needless to say, an oil spill will have devastating environmental and socioeconomic effects that will never recover. It will also be a public health, mental health, and emergency medicine nightmare in which there is no activation of plan in place due to oil spills being a relatively new reality in our modern world. Simply put, I have no idea what to do, and I don't know what to expect. There is very little research and few people trained in the medical world that know how to deal with these issues, as no one truly knows the long-term consequences of an oil spill. What is known right now is grave and scary. 
There is evidence showing how people living in communities affected by an oil spill, as well as the cleanup workers, have a major increase in mental health problems including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, and suicide. Other physical problems include eye, nose, and throat irritation, nosebleeds, headaches, nausea, gastrointestinal and respiratory problems. The long-term health consequences, which are still being studied and not yet fully understood, allude to mental health problems, cancer, birth defects, gastrointestinal, neurological, and respiratory diseases. I also cannot even imagine how an approval for this project would erode our First Nations culture and the psychological impact it will evoke on them as a people. Are we really willing to put the health of the people of British Columbia and Alberta and its First Nations peoples at risk so that a multi-billion dollar company can make more billions of dollars? It also seems ironic to me that Enbridge has the Enbridge Ride to Conquer Cancer. It's a two-day charity bike ride event that focuses on eradicating cancer from our world. I have a better idea. Stop the shabby pipeline practices, clean up your poor history of environmental damage, and eliminate spills from our world. This is an effective tool in eliminating cancer from our world, much more effective than a two-day bike ride. I'd like to finish this speech with an experience of mine that I had in Bella Bella while on a nursing assignment. The town is located in the Great Bear Rainforest and will be heavily affected if, if there is and when there is a tanker spill. On my days off, I had the fortunate opportunity to kayak throughout many beautiful ocean channels and explore this magnificent area. In one six-hour day of kayaking, I came across sunflower sea stars. They're the largest sea star in the world. Okra and blood sea stars. Dungeness crabs and many other invertebrates. Ravens, eagles, sandhill cranes, blue herons, numerous other waterfowl, herring, sea otters, seals, porpoises, and a pair of wolves. This experience cannot be taken away from me and will stay with me forever. However, I fear it will be taken away from others. Are we willing to put this type of area again at risk with increased tanker traffic and an oil spill? There is nowhere else like it on Earth with its majestic waters, mountains, forests, and wildlife. Not to mention its coastal First Nations peoples and their surrounding communities. This area, along with the pipeline route that passes through a fragile mountain and forest ecosystem, needs to be protected from Enbridge and all other oil companies. Uh, I would like to thank the panel for taking the time to listen to me today and all the other citizens of Alberta and British Columbia who chose to speak and will continue to speak at these hearings. I just ask that you please listen to the people and speak for the people's interests when you give your final recommendation to the federal government. And to Enbridge, the people of British Columbia have spoken and they've opened the back door for you. Please leave and don't come back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeRoche. Thank you for coming this afternoon to present your views. Please begin. All right. Um, thanks for having me here to speak. Uh, I'm speaking as a young person. I recently graduated from UBC, and uh, so a young person about to start my working life. Um, many years of, of work ahead of me, and uh, I'm also speaking as someone who enjoys outdoor recreation and traveling within British Columbia. Um, so on the first point, uh, I'm concerned about the economic opportunities uh, in relation to uh, the Enbridge proposal. Um, and uh, I, of course, want job opportunities um, as I head forward into my working life. But uh, I'm concerned that this project creates few opportunities at the cost of many others. Um, I urge the Joint Review Panel to consider the job creation promised in the Northern Gateway proposal, not in isolation with those, those uh, charts on their website, um, but in consideration, consideration with trade-offs that would be made should this project go through. I'm in opposition to this project because it poses a direct threat uh, to the success and growth of the tourism industry specifically in BC. In 2011, BC's tourism sector was a $7.35 billion industry and employed 127,000 people. The industry has been reliably growing for more than a decade. Whale watching, sea kayaking, and sport fishing are just a few tourism activities that have a huge potential for growth in the waters near Kitimat and along the proposed tanker routes and in the watercourses that would be crossed by the pi proposed pipelines. 
a spill or leak would devastate the potential for any of the activities. And Enbridge's records make it clear that it is a question of when and where, not if a spill will occur. The DFO, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, has listed proposed tanker traffic from the Northern Gateway Project as a threat to whale populations on the BC coast. Ship strikes are a known killer of whales. Spotters uh, aboard ships can only be effective in good visibility and full daylight, which is a restriction that is impossible within the proposal uh, of the Northern Gateway Project. Um, people travel from all over all around the world to go on whale watching tours, and it is in the interest of all British Columbians and Canadians to preserve whale populations, if only for this industry. Further, shipping security would limit tourism activities along shipping channels. The wilderness in that part of the province, its isolation from resource extraction industries, uh, is found in few other places in the world and is a valuable commodity in itself. It attracts many tourist dollars and has the potential to attract many, many more. This coast is known for some of the best saltwater sport fishing experiences in the world and has world-class lodges to prove it. The mere presence of pipelines, a tanker port, and super tankers robs the coast of its value, its aesthetic value even, for tourism. This project does propose job creation, um, hundreds of jobs for northern BC, but they are almost all temporary jobs. Northern BC has high, higher unemployment rates than much of the province, and it is clear that job creation is needed. But the amateur pro proposal actually would rob British Columbians of long-term employment by pitting this project against sustainable tourist, tourism economy. After the construction phase, most jobs associated with the proposal would end, but the opportunity cost to tourism would remain permanently. This proposal offers temporary jobs at a permanent cost to sustainable tourism jobs. As a recent university graduate, I'm concerned with the kinds of long-term jobs that will be available to me over the next few years. But one cannot get a mortgage as a temporary employee. Even short-term seasonal tourism jobs are preferable to temporary pipeline construction jobs since this employment can be relied upon year after year. Finally, as a traveler of BC and a lover of outdoor rec recreation, I'm concerned about the aesthetic impact of this project on places I have visited and places I wish to explore. I vacationed twice to Haida Gwaii in the past five years um, for about two weeks each time, and the experiences I had there and the special landscapes that I visited would be ruined by even the sight of a super tanker cruising in the distance. That value um, for recreation is threatened just by the way the proposal would rob the area of its wilderness. On the grounds of all the uh, of all the points I've spoken to, I ask you, you, the members of the Joint Review Panel, to not recommend this project for approval. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for each of you for coming forward. Uh, again, uh, it's wonderful to see younger people uh, prepared to uh, present their views to the panel. It's much appreciated. Thank you.
Mr. Schultz, you look like you're ready to uh, proceed, so why don't you do that, please, with your oral statement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Schultz, and I've been a realtor in White Rock, B.C. for the last 37 years. For the last 10 years, I've been mostly retired and earning my living as a landlord. Um, I give you this background to show you that not all so-called radical environmentalists environmentalists are at the fringes of our society. I'm a naturalized Canadian, having received most of my education in Canadian public schools, actually most of it in Calgary, um, where my father worked in the oil industry. Um, during the schooling, I learned that Canada was a democratic society that believed and supported the will of the pe people, the freedom of expression, and equal access to opportunity for all and that, the, and that the society and government looked after the best interests of the people, especially those less fortunate than ourselves. This, I believe, was true for the most part until the late 70s and early 80s. My personal belief is that our society and our government either are either allowing or working towards eroding these basic principles of Canadian society. I am sure you have heard from many experts, environmentalists, scientists, lawyers, and First Nations. I am none of these, but I am a conscientious citizen concerned about the future of our province, our country, and the future of my six children. Based on our experience of the Exxon Valdez and the BP Gulf disasters, my gravest concerns are for the increased tanker traffic off our coast in treacherous waters. The Exxon Valdez spill, I believe, still has major repercussions economically, environmentally, and socially 24 years, a quarter of a century after the fact. I am concerned that many of the tankers that will carry tar sands bitumen along our coast will be registered in ports of convenience. If liabilities of a spill are big enough, they will not pay for cleanup and damages. That means I and you as taxpayers will have to foot the bill. The Exxon Valdez lawsuit for liability and damages was settled after endless appeals by Exxon in July 2008, almost 20 years after the disaster. This is the kind of delay and stalling that we can count on in future spills as well. Um, I was unable to assert a certain if, in fact, Exxon had paid the judgment as of now. It seems the question we all must ask ourselves with any project of this nature, what is the benefit of this project to the community? The community being Canadians, British Columbians, people living along the pipeline route, people living along the coast, and people whose livelihood will be impacted by oil spills, either on land or water. Is this project for the benefit of these communities or for the benefit of foreign oil companies and other countries? There are basically seven oil companies in the world that control oil production and distribution. None of them are Canadian enterprises. Yes, they have Canadian subsidiaries, but in reality they are not controlled or governed by Canada's best interests. I would suggest it is in the best interest of Canada and BC to leave the oil sands bitumen in the ground until better technology is available to process it. There seems little doubt that it will be worth more in the future. Alternatively, refining the bitumen should be done at source in Fort McMurray or close by. Then the finished product could be shipped. Better yet, let us put our time, energy, and dollars into developing alternative sustainable energy sources for more jobs and a better future for Canada and the world. Oil production, and especially tar sands, should not be subsidized by taxpayers of Canada. As a matter of self-interest, I wish to I do not wish to pay as a taxpayer to subsidize oil companies, especially tar sands oil, or for the cleanup of oil spills on our beautiful coast. Nor do I want the beach two blocks from my house devastated by oil spills. I wish to continue swimming there for 45 days a year. Um, in addition, uh, 
I would like to suggest that should this project go ahead, uh, that there be um, bonds placed by both N Enbridge for their potential uh, spills along the pipeline in amounts equivalent to potential um, spills. I know the oil tanker uh, Exxon Valdez, the, the costs were into the billions of dollars. And if these um, bonds for both tankers and uh, pipelines were high enough, I believe the project would n not go ahead. In addition, it might be beneficial to make the uh, senior management and directors of the corporations involved personally responsible for the devastation that is created. And again, I think um, that they would immediately withdraw their support for either of those items. Um, I wish to leave you with one more thought. This is a quote from the Supreme Court of Canada decision in, two th in Ju June 2001. It concerns a case of um, spray tech and Chemlon against the town of Hudson. Uh, although this is a chemical company that tried to prevent uh, legislation to stop the city from uh, having legislation uh, against the use of cosmetic pesticides, and this is not the subject of this inquiry, I think one statement in their decision is pertinent to this. In, and the statement is as follows. In order to achieve sustainable development, policies must be based on the precautionary principle. Environmental measures must anticipate, prevent, and attack the causes of environmental degradation where there are threats of serious or irreversible damage. Lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a re reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Okay, thanks. Uh Good afternoon, Ms. Watkins. Um, please share your oral statement with us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Watkins. I'm a telecare worker and a special education teacher. Um, some of my greatest accomplishments, I feel, as a teacher have often been born from the linking of nature and the natural with the children that I work with. Uh, my greatest joy as a Canadian citizen is that uh, I can go outside every day and thrive in our environment. As a teacher, um, I've attempted to prepare for this testimony by t taking some time and asking questions and doing some basic research, but I'd also like to share that uh, my family, uh, closest family, lives in Edmonton. Uh, my nephew trained as an electrician. My hope was uh, for him. Sorry. That he would learn about cumulative energy, solar panels, and the creation of a future for his children. Uh, instead, he has been indoctrinated uh, into the tar sands um, world. He believes uh, that he can only feed his family if he works uh, in the tar sands, destroying the earth. I recognize that you have done and seen a great deal, uh, obviously, just having the privilege of watching uh, this panel. Um, we have uh, spent some time in the Amazon and uh, learned about the uh, Ashwar and uh, different communities who are also fighting um, to protect their land from the oil companies. Um, I perceive that... Uh, and I always felt that we would do things in a more um, honorable manner. I think 
that is something that I felt as a Canadian and somewhat smugly, I think, that we would not destroy our country uh, in oil extraction. Uh, I have educated myself, sadly, um, that we uh, uh, now, the Canadian tar sands, um, has been considered and is the dirtiest oil uh, with the highest extraction footprint in on the earth. Um, so clearly, I was wrong. And sadly, I now understand that we are going through the same thing and we're doing the same thing to our land that many of the companies that we've supported are, have been doing in the Amazon. Um, I guess we're blessed that we're speaking to a panel of caring people as opposed to uh, the Quechua community that we've been following as a group of 400 who are now preparing Ecuadorian government and also the uh, biggest South American oil company. Um, in some ways, I also felt that if we took our oil from our own soil, we would feel the consequences and therefore change. Um, and that is something that I have been looking for. <laughs> Uh, not only to understand what we're doing, but also to bring a sign of hope. Um, when I learned that we use uh, 1.8 billion liters of uh, clean water from the Athabasca River to turn into wastewater every day um, and then place it into leaking uh, tailings ponds, I felt that single fact should have stopped us, stopped us in our tracks a long time ago as a nation and also as a community. Um, now I I'm aware we are bringing a supposedly a 1,000 kilometer pipeline. I'm wondering uh, if anybody's ever considered the effects of the actual mining or creating of the infrastructure of the pipeline. Has that ever, excuse me, been put into the mix of our government and our spending? Um, much else has been said to you that I respect. Um, and I, I think I spent some time asking friends and family in our community, do you uh, support this project? And listened to the answers. And two of the answers that I got were that, yes, we do support it because we can make money. We can make money on our stock options. We've made money now. Um, so I guess it shouldn't shock me that you can make money on nothing and that it hasn't occurred yet. Uh, but again, we need to rethink the way we think. And in fact, when I asked these questions, the other answer was, well, yes, because this is how we make our money to create our health care system. This is the way it is. And if you don't understand the way it is, then you can't participate. And one, I would like to participate fully in our community. I would also like to say that if we've created this situation, we can change it. Uh, we can change it by the way we think. We can change it by the way we, we invest our money. Um, and we can also change it by uh, bringing our government to task. Um, apparently, many of the people think that making money on Edbridge stocks is um, acceptable collateral damage. Uh, and um, I think watching our current Canadian government aggressively promoting this pipeline and all things tar sands has been an education in itself for me. Uh, many of the environmental stewards and NGOs looking for a reasonable debate on this issue have spoken to this panel and publicly about their concerns. The result was to not only be labeled as radical extremists by our government, but also it appears to me from following the panel that every time someone spoke out, uh, similar to in the Amazon, there was a consequence for that. And um, it appears that in response to concerns about the pipeline and the environmental impacts, the federal government of the day has re refused to wait for the findings of this panel and instead has rammed through two massive omnibudget bills that have gutted most of our environmental laws and too many to mention. Uh, more pipeline proposals from Kinder Morton and uh, are coming down our pipeline to, to BC. The other 
other things that I've noticed are that conservatives in the Alberta are now uh, fundraising for the B.C. Liberals' um, election because they feel that the B.C. Liberals will be easier to deal with on the pipeline issue. Uh, this is crossing a tremendous amount of lines uh, for me as a citizen, but to watch where our uh, democracy is going. Uh, sadly, um, this pipeline, I think, has been a catalyst and also an excuse uh, for significant assaults on our democracy and sadly championed by our own Canadian government. Um, uh, we've learned of several new areas. Uh, I think Edgar Schmidt, uh, a senior lawyer with the Department of Justice, uh, one of his duties was to review bills that might violate our char Charter of Rights. Uh, but when he filed a court case claiming the department itself was breaking the laws with regards to the charter, our charter of rights, he was promptly suspended without pay. Um, he's now taking the Canadian government to court. He's a lawyer, uh, so he's representing himself. Um, I think he, from what I understood, he was motivated by going to um, Egypt and finding that democracy in that country needs to be respected, but coming back to our country and finding that we also need to stand up for ourselves and our democracy. Um, I believe we've created some new heroes um, now as our Canadians deal with oil issues, but also how we think about our economy. Um, I would rather be talking to you about creating an energy future that does not require the belief that our econ economic system is solely based on the reckless destruction of the very fabric of our democracy and the earth. Um, as a result, I sought, uh, I did not want this testimony to be one of despair. Um, I looked for hope, and um, one of the areas that I looked for hope in was I reread the book, The Geography of Hope, by Chris Turner. Um, he, and I will leave you with what I hope is something hopeful. Uh, the world of clean, renewable energy exists. Uh, everything we need to create for ourselves, our future, and our children is already uh, in Canada, and we need to move towards that. And I wish this panel great good luck in uh, moving in that direction. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your views. Ms. Winterhalt, thank you for coming to uh, help us understand your perspective. You have 10 minutes. Please begin. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to express to you my strong opposition to the Enbridge Northern Gateway Pipeline Project here today on unceded Coast Salish territory. My name is Leslie Winterhalt, and I was born in Montreal, Quebec. I spent my childhood and early adult years in Montreal, where I attended McGill University. I then moved to Vancouver in 2010 to pursue graduate studies in the Department of Geography at the University of British Columbia. My first visit to British Columbia was on a grade 11 class trip. Even before I had landed at the Vancouver airport, I was captivated by the mountains from the air. We stayed our first two nights in the town of Mission, and I spent the entire bus ride from the airport to Mission, not chatting with my friends, as most girls of that age might do, but instead I was glued to the window, taking in the incredible landscape. The trees felt so green, so giant. The air seemed not just cleaner, but it felt alive. I was struck by so many things on that week-long trip. It was the month of March, and broken clouds hugged the landscape and made the place feel even more magical. We went sturgeon fishing on the Fraser River, and I was blown away that one could catch these giant fish on this river that flows right through Vancouver. That such a large river could be so full of life did not align with my previous understandings. The St. Lawrence River surrounds the island of Montreal, but my cultural understanding of that river is not related to the wildlife that it supports. To me, it largely symbolizes transportation. And so while it may also support a diversity of important fish species, my understanding of it was not as such. In contrast, the Fraser River running through Vancouver is so incredibly important to fisheries, particularly salmon, which defines Vancouver's and largely British Columbia's history and identity prior to European contact and continuing through to today. And it is this connection that I would like to highlight. Here in British Columbia, we draw our identity from the land. BC's motto is Splendor Sin no Kasu, which means splendor without diminishment. Our slogan appears on our license plates as Beautiful British Columbia, or the best place on earth, or in the case of tourism BC, Supernatural British Columbia. The provincial flag, as you can see here on display in the hearing room, 
depicts a setting sun on a backdrop of blue waves representing the Pacific Ocean and wavy white bars representing the mountain ranges. The symbols we use to represent ourselves reflect the beauty of this landscape. So when Enbridge proposes to run a diluted vitamin